Hey listeners, this is Nick, and welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Today, David, Nathan, and I are continuing on our journey through Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, now covering Volume 3. Take a read through and listen in as we talk through this volume's direct commentary on the nature of history, the magical and or aimless arc of Pierre, and just how many times Tolstoy is going to kill off key characters and then bring them back again. Seriously, Leo, our hearts just can't handle that, man. As always, grab a copy, do some reading, and stick around for the conversation. For the human mind, absolute continuity of motion is inconceivable. The laws behind any motion become comprehensible to man only when he breaks that motion down into arbitrarily selected units and subjects these to examination. But at the same time, this arbitrary subdivision of continuous motion into discontinuous units is the cause of much human error. We all know the fallacy, a sophism to the ancients, whereby a tortoise that has a start on Achilles will never be caught up by him, even though Achilles is walking ten times faster than the tortoise. While Achilles is busy covering a certain distance between him and the tortoise, the tortoise leading the way will have covered another one-tenth of that distance. Achilles covers that tenth, by which time the tortoise has covered another hundredth, and so on ad infinitum. This problem was considered by the ancients to have no solution. The absurdity of the conclusion that Achilles will never overtake the tortoise arises from the arbitrary decision to subdivide the motion into discrete units, whereas the motion of both Achilles and the tortoise was continuous. By adopting smaller and smaller units of motion, all we do is get closer and closer to a solution to the problem without ever reaching it. Only by allowing for an infinitely small quantity and a progression rising from it up to a tenth, and by taking the sum of that geometrical progression, can we arrive at a solution of this problem. A new branch of mathematics taking account of infinitely small quantities can now consider other more complex problems of motion and provide solutions to problems that once seemed insoluble. When applied to these problems of motion, this new branch of mathematics, unknown to the ancients, allows for infinitely small quantities, and by doing so, creates the basic condition of motion, absolute continuity, thus correcting the inevitable mistake that the human intellect is bound to make when it rejects continuous motion in favor of discrete units of motion. In the search for laws of historical movement, exactly the same thing occurs. The movement of humanity, arising from a countless series of actions arbitrarily performed by many individuals, is a continuous phenomenon. The aim of history is to work out what laws lie behind this movement. But in its attempt to establish the laws behind the continuous movement that arises from all those arbitrary individual actions taken together, the human mind accepts a subdivision into arbitrarily determined discrete units. The first thing history does is take an arbitrary series of continuous events and examines it separately, whereas in fact no event can ever have a beginning because an individual event flows without any break in continuity from one another. The second thing history does is to treat the actions of a single person, king, or commander as the sum total of everybody else's individual will, whereas in fact the sum of individual wills will never express itself into the actions of a single historical personage. In the development of historical science, smaller and smaller units are selected for analysis, as if this is the path that leads to truth. But however small the units determined by history, we feel that the acceptance of any discrete unit, or of a beginning to any phenomenon, or the idea that multiple wills express themselves in the actions of any one historical personage, is intrinsically wrong. Criticism can effortlessly ensure that every conclusion of history gets blown away like dust, leaving no trace behind, simply by selecting a greater or smaller discrete unit for analysis. And criticism has every right to do this because the selection of historical units is always an arbitrary business. Only by adopting an infinitely small unit for observation, the differential in history otherwise known as human homogeneity, and perfecting the art of integration, the adding up of infinitesimals, can we have any hope of determining the laws of history. So now that we're alone, yeah. we've lost all viewers, all possible listeners. Uh, yeah. What do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> so sometimes reading this book feels like my human mind has accepted a subdivision of arbitrarily determined discrete units. <laughs> I have uh, 
I have notes where I have arbitrarily subdivided Tolstoy's Volume Three into subunits. If you want me to read them, yeah, let's let's hear those recap. discrete units. Okay, so to recap the events in Volume Three, uh, we kind of start off and we have Tolstoy's argument that basically people don't really have anything to do with what happens in history. It all happens because stuff is interconnected and you can't get outside the flow of history. We kind of move back into more of the war stuff. So Napoleon's moving into Russia. Alexander wants to call it off. He sends kind of his messenger and he ends up meeting Napoleon. And then Napoleon's kind of like super high on himself. And then there's that one scene where basically when he finally meets Napoleon, it's in the same exact room of the same exact house where he had the basically the guidance from Alexander given to him due to how the war lines have progressed. So that was, that was pretty slick. We got Andre goes back in the army, and then we kind of see his perception of military genius and strategy and how all this concept of scientific analysis doesn't really fit because that's just not how war works. Nicolay goes back in the army. Um, we see a little view of Natasha. She's sick. The doctors can't really do anything. Tolstoy is kind of oddly criticizing like medical science. Do you guys catch that? Yeah, he seems very down on, on medicine. Yeah, which I thought was maybe one of the parts of the book that didn't age real well. <laughs> Every once in a while, he takes a dig at science. Yeah. Because it's too rational. Yeah, and I think that's yeah that's a good thing to point out because I agree with him in some of his, like, how do we characterize human behavior, that being too rational, the science way. But when he was kind of making fun of, you know, medicine, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Medicine's pretty useful. I'm kind of on board. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is oh, the third leading cause of death in America, which is just hospitals fucking up. So, is you know. Medicine. <laughs> Moving on <laughs> from our from our medical skeptics, apparently. Well, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, let's see. Oh, my favorite part, I, I think, is uh, lines up perfectly with the current moment, is when Pierre is decoding the passages, looking with his number theory, and decides that he's going to be Hilarious. the one to assassinate Napoleon because he adds up the names The and process of him like trying to find the right way to say his name so that it would make yeah. 666. Genius. Yeah. Just to get... <laughs> I mean, there's whole whole corners of the internet, not even corners, whole sections of the internet that are obsessed with like stuff like this. I don't know if you've ever gone down that rabbit hole of number theory, but it is alive and well. Let's see. Uh, part one wraps up with Petya has his army obsession, and he's super into going to see Alexander. And by doing so, he kind of sneaks out, ends up like almost getting crushed, basically getting injured by the, the fervor. And this is Natasha's, kind of what, 14-year-old brother? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and he kind of, you know, he wants to be a man, he wants to be involved. There's this whole swell of, like, pro-Russia enthusiasm, so he gets kind of mixed up in that. Part two begins, uh, it's kind of the structure of this volume. Tolstoy is inserting more and more of his commentary on history. It's, much, it's getting and, more and more, um, like, East of Eden as we go along, I think. Yeah, where he's very, he's telling you exactly how he views it, and this is the moral, this is the... I feel like he, he, he kind of got fatigued with telling the story. He's like, ah, listen, this is how it is, okay? Yeah. I mean, I like it. Like when he says stuff like uh, the higher they stand in the social hierarchy, the less freedom they have. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I get that. I believe that. I don't think people are really pulling the shots. I think we're all stuck I wonder in if, it. if people misinterpreted parts of the first couple volumes. It's like, you know what? Fuck it. These people are getting it wrong. Here is what the story <laughs> is about, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a good point. Yeah. Because this is released serially. Yeah. Maybe. I mean... That good segue into uh, one of the next events of part two is Bolkonsky's basically, he's going down, he's starting to lose it. Old Bolkonsky. Old Bolkonsky. I was like, Andre yes, was... old Prince Bolkonsky. That's, that's harsh. Yes. So old Bolkonsky is, is uh, succumbing to his... Uh, senility. Yeah. Yes, senility. That's a good word for it. Um, but essentially the town of Sol Smolensk, that's the pronunciation. I, I'm leaning to you, Nathan, for, for pronunciations. Yeah, that is... Well done. Okay. Sure. Uh, let's see, Andre basically is urging uh, Maria to get out of Bald Hills because basically gave it a couple days since Smolensk went down. We got uh, kind of a glimpse into the Russian salons as they kind of all navigated around, you know, how like people change political favor. And there's a certain way to talk about people in the right way while saving your own face. So we saw um, Vasily uh, kind of navigating those Russian salons. 
Okay, what, what what we got next? Uh, Napoleon's uh, kind of closing in on Moscow. Uh, old Prince Bolkonsky eventually dies. Uh, and then, mixing back in some of that romance, when Maria gets trapped and the peasants basically rebel against her and the nobility, and there's those kind of undercurrents, and eventually uh, Nikolay has to show up and saves her by whipping everybody into shape. And then all of a sudden he's in love with Maria. Mm -hmm. Which is a very surprising turn of events. Like she was kind of the most unlovable female character in the whole book. And then Nikolai's like, actually. Oh, really? Why is she unlovable? I don't know. She's just repeatedly said to be unlovable in the book. Nobody seems to want her. She's like, she's like rich and available. And basically nobody wants to be around her. Because of her like proselytizing or something? I think her proselytizing and her father, maybe. Okay. I mean, she's she's also plain. Uh, yeah, I think that's the thing is she's she's plain and she doesn't like play the game. Yeah. Yeah. That everyone else is playing. I guess Boris wanted he, Boris really wanted her to like reciprocate, and she totally missed that cue. So there was that. At this point, I'm kind of like, all right, Tolstoy. You're you're still doing the love triangles, huh? <laughs> <laughs> just just moving characters around, saying this one's in love with this one. Uh, I get it. Uh, so then we get into the Battle of Borodino um, and more Borodino. historical. Borod. Do, 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 do it again, one more time. Borodino. Okay, what Nathan said. We were going with that battle, and uh, <laughs> uh, we sort of have. Even more of uh, Tolstoy giving his insights and talking about how everything is basically filtered down in terms of historical summaries of real events. He's talking about the Russian views and, and how, how historians talk about these events, but in reality, it was kind of just a mess. And I guess the summary of that battle is that victory by the French, but ultimately like a long victory by the Russians because of how much they were weakened. I just I just want to say that Actually, it's a mess. It sounds like Tolstoy's philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> like of in writing fiction? Of everything. It's just like, there are no rules. There's no way to understand. You can't categorize it. Actually, it's it's all just a mess. Mm. I mean, I think technically his his stance in like religion and, and social social hierarchy was he was a Christian anarchist. Does that sound right? Did anybody read that Wikipedia article? <laughs> Which I think it fits, right? It fits like the divine, you know, the divine sort of uh, influence mixed with the chaos of everything's a mess. That's what, that's what I'm going with. Yeah. yeah. Was he, I mean, was he actually an anarchist or was he more just like a recluse? I mean, did he, did he believe in no government or he, he just believed that government in itself is not an, an adequate answer because it's also caught up in a infinite and uncategorizable stream of events and you can't put your faith in it? I feel like... Only from having read Tolstoy that that second thing you said fits with what his vibe is. But do I know his like political tracks? Not really. I had a question. Just in a few pages previously, speaking of the Battle of Borodino? Borodino? <laughs> Borodino. Borodino. There's, there's a passage at the bottom of page 908. It seems like he's talking about God? So it says, But even though the battle was nearing its end and the men could sense all the horror of their actions... Even though they would have been glad to stop, they were still in the grip of an inexplicable, mysterious force which kept the surviving gunners, they were down to one and three, running with sweat, filthy with powder and blood, stumbling about and gasping with exhaustion, as they went on bringing up charges, loading the guns, taking aim and lighting the fuses, so that the cannonballs, as fast and as vicious as ever, flew across from both sides to splatter human flesh, keeping the whole ghastly business going, not by the will of man, but by the will of the one who governs men and worlds. It's almost like an indictment of God a little bit, or at least saying that all of this bloodshed and horror seems to be part of God's will. I think that's that's essentially a tenet of Christian anarchy, which is that that chaos is present, and that's actually, that's how you explain it. It's a function of, you know, I guess, merging God's will with the reality and, and the the chaos of it all but to say chaos is to assume a certain degree of understanding and i i think that he's quite careful not to assert that degree of understanding you know what i mean like to say that this is cha- that this is chaos and that that it's that it's meaningless is one thing to say that it's part of a divine will 
is to say that it appears as chaos and meaninglessness to me, but it's part of something, a, a different will or a different pattern that I can't perceive. Well, I think that's kind of what Nick was getting at in this very long opening passage, was that men keep trying to understand these this idea of history by breaking it down into these things. And this goes to our argument from volume two, which actually should be for volume three, because previous to this, I was <laughs> convinced that Tolstoy was more, and he still is obviously obsessed with the subjective experience, mm-hmm. but outside of that, he's really concerned, especially in this volume, with this idea of just history has this momentum and this path And these people, even the ones we consider great people like Napoleon, even though they have some small effect on it, history is going to go where it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. This Mm -hmm. is why I'm thinking like like some sort of like Calvinistic divine plan sort of thing, or I guess maybe even Hegelian sort of idea of history is that it's it's moving towards some goal. History has a a progression. No. Yes. Yeah. I. I, Does he? I, at least I don't I don't see it yet that there's a stated purpose. Well, I'm not saying that that Tolstoy sees it. He's just saying that this exists, and maybe, like you said, we're we're not going to understand it, but it's there. Yeah, and that's also mixed with the fact that you have to define the difference between history as the progression as it's happening, right? And that's the thing that even great men can't necessarily influence. But what? can be influenced is the perception of history in the rearview mirror, which great men and historians will always influence by casting it in whatever light they want and taking whatever sub-interval they want. Until Tolstoy comes around and says they got it all wrong. (laughs) Yeah. He said, you weren't using calculus to do history. (laughs) Let me tell you how to do it. It's all about infinitesimal sums. All right, I'm going back into going back into the summary okay. events. How, how are we doing, Nick? How where are we at? Uh, we're like halfway through. We're doing, All right, we're doing doing well. So uh, this is actually I already want to talk about this when Pierre just sort of like aimlessly gets back and like wanders into battle. Yeah, did that sort of trip you guys up? Where he's just like, I'm gonna go to battle, and he's just wandering through. That's these... a thing that you have the privilege to do if you're a noble. You could just. Yeah, where everybody's just dying around him, and he's just sort of, I, like, I picture him as just, like, a lost child. Yeah. Just, like, it's, yeah, that was, like, fascinating. And I, I guess, you know, it, it sort of progresses from there, because you can argue that he gets more and more aimless throughout the arc of this volume. Yeah, he, he this, his section feels like some sort of, like, dark Buster Keaton film or something. Like, the way he, like, goes yeah. up and almost strangles a guy to death, yeah. and then he's like, oh, shit, I'm in the wrong place. Goes yeah. back down, and the soldiers are running up. It was... It was oddly comical. Yeah, just the unraveling of yeah. Pierre. But I, do you guys get the feeling that Pierre is almost like a magical character? Yeah. Yes. Like, he keeps, like, manhandling these French soldiers, and they can't do anything about it. Although at the end of Volume 3, he's imprisoned. Well, you great. You ruined my, you ruined my summer. Well. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> After beating up two French soldiers who had guns. Yeah. Well, how about this? Keep that theme... And as we step through the events, we'll categorize them in in that manner. Because I, I think that's actually the right way to view Pierre. Is he sort of he sort of is this magical being now? And I don't really know where that fits in. But a lot of these events were sort of you know him like rising above like the rational reality happening to everyone. There's else. There's some clear connections between him and Christ. Because there's this his constant yeah. obsession with self sacrifice and giving things away and. There's these weird little ties that Tolstoy puts in. Anyway, yeah, sorry, go ahead, continue, continue. Yep, I agree with that vibe. Uh, next, we have Andre gets injured again, gets hit by a shell, has uh, surgery, ends up in the same like hospital, essentially, as Anatole, and Anatole with his amputated leg. Called and it. And then Andre's like, oh, what? Oh, because of the rehabilitation of Anatole? <laughs> Is, was he rehabilitated? <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with your volume two uh, projection being <laughs> confirmed here. I would say the rehabilitation <laughs> of Andre is much more plausible and defensible. Yes, I would agree with that. But, uh, you know, Andre is like, at the end of that, there's a paragraph about just wanting to believe in life and love Compassion. and like all this stuff, yeah. right? So part three opens up and then that's when we get that wonderful mathematical quote uh, at the beginning of this episode with basically Tolstoy applying the foundations of calculus to history, which I, I don't know, I think it's great that uh, um, somebody was doing it 
back in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Not a lot of people are going to like that, huh? Um, okay, maybe we'll cut that. All right, next we have uh, military folk uh, trying to figure out whether or not to defend Moscow. There's that whole thing. And I think there's a quote in there where Kutuzov's already like, Moscow's already been lost. Kutuzov. Did I make that up? Did it happen? Kutuzov. Is that <laughs> the weird long analogy of Moscow being like a beehive? Yeah. That was a that long was, analogy. Yeah. Really long. Re- I was like, man, yeah. is Tolstoy a beekeeper? This is like <laughs> yeah. some details about bees. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is an emotional description of a beehive. It was odd. <laughs> Good call. Good, uh, yeah, good <laughs> injection. Okay, we have, uh, oh, when uh, Pierre's wife, Lane, wants to get her divorce, and she goes through all of, like, the mental gymnastics of, like, applying religion to justify it. <laughs> that was pretty I funny. That was actually kind of yeah. hilarious. That very, was great. Very great. So Pierre makes it back to Moscow, and he's kind of just totally aimless at this point. Um, the sections where the Rostovs are trying to leave Moscow, essentially they're packing up all their material possessions, and then Natasha is like, wait, you know, we need to make space for the wounded. And then they just keep making more and more space while uh, the Rostovs themselves are kind of like almost grimacing that Natasha is taking this idealist version where they're like, yeah, but we got all of our stuff with us and we're about to be poor unless Nikolay marries a rich woman. But luckily he's in love with one now. So this is all going to work out fine. I thought that was a nice moment, actually, like that people are trying to just ignore what's going on around them and just save as much of their stuff as possible. And like that, the yeah. breaking point when they're like, ah, you're right. I'm a, I'm a shitty person. Yeah. That was the, the Let's argument with the people mother instead. Yeah. The mother sort of just gave up. She's like, yeah. right, I mean, it's, fine. it's, I mean, it's the rehabilitation of Natasha essentially. Right. That's like the first time she's back and she sort of has purpose again. And, and, uh, that's going on. Yeah. Um, Oh, the uh, plot twist after this is it turns out that Andre didn't die again. Wait, let's just note that <laughs> I think twice in the book it says explicitly that Andre died. Yeah. I yeah. mean, in and this then, section. Surprise. Andre's dead. Pierre finds out that Andre is dead. I know. Actually, he's in Natasha's caravan. Yeah. Convenient. I feel like he could have hinted that he was dead without actually just saying that he was dead. and like. So you guys didn't watch Game of Thrones? No. <laughs> well, we're back on the, that. Horse the Jon Snow overlay here, because this happened twice with Jon Snow. And you're like, they're not going to do it again. They already did that. They already brought him back from the dead once. They can't do it again. And they did it again. Yeah. It's straight plagiarism. All the moves. This is the urtext. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Andre ends up also magically in the caravan with the Rostovs. Magically. Um, so, Nepo- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 not scientifically, not rationally, magically. Uh, so Napoleon makes it to Moscow, and since everybody has basically uh, gotten the hell out of there, it's a bit of a letdown for him. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of bummer town, which I guess is the point that he wanted to have conquered like a fully alive city. You know, I guess like Berlin and, and some of the other places that were mentioned that basically when Napoleon rolled through, the French took over, but the city was preserved. Is that why he's kind of bummed? Yeah, I, I think... Anything to feed his ego, like that people, I think, like willingly bent the knee, maybe. I'm not sure exactly what that's about. Mm, yeah. 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 Tolstoy really digs into Napoleon a lot in this volume, that's for sure. Yeah, that's that's definitely accurate. And basically, you know, in the you know coming scenes and chapters, the city is just getting looted. It's getting destroyed. There was that crazy mob stomping to yes. death scene. Uh, yeah, that was brutal. For the guy that had like a minor infraction against him and they just labeled as, you know, a full-blown traitor who was going to be executed. He was accused of writing or of distributing this tract and he claimed to have written it, but nobody believed him. Yeah. But they decided to, well, I think he was going to be exiled. Yeah, he was supposed to be exiled, but then just in that moment, he's like, yeah, I'll just throw him to the to the. Mob. This was like the police chief or like mm-hmm. the stand-in mayor of Moscow, right? R- yeah. Rostop Chin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. He was, he's the mayor, governor. Governor or, or something? Okay. Lead yeah. political person. And he was just kind of, he just happened to be passing when this crowd sort of came around him. And he's like, shit, I need to feed them some something. Is yeah, well, he was looking happened? for a way to basically kind of manage the situation in a way. To mm-hmm. pacify them or basically to take their, I don't know, their their fervor 
and have it not be destructive. So he was trying to kind of use that situation. Also, I think he also wanted to like feed his ego because he had basically urged them on this whole time with these posters saying that they're going to stand, they're never going to mm-hmm. abandon Moscow, they're going to kill the French. And now he's about to get out of there and there's no there's no army there to fight the French. And I yeah. think he wanted to save face and say like, oh yeah, this guy, it's his fault. Kill him. The, yeah, he betrayed Moscow. There's a really good passage of him like yeah. trying to rationalize his actions. I don't know if you guys mm, remember mm-hmm. that. There's a lot of a lot of that in this book. A lot of, or at least this volume, I, I feel like, especially with all of the horrors of war, a lot of like trying to rationalize behavior. Mm-hmm. It's because, like Tolstoy says, you can't really actually change anything. It's all just going to progress on its own. All you can do is change your perception in the rearview mirror. That's my thesis for this. Here we go. Since time began and men started killing each other. No man has ever committed such a crime against one of his fellows without comforting himself with the same idea. This idea is the public good. <laughs> a supposed benefit for other people. Yeah. And we all we all do that ourselves, right? Um, okay, so on the home stretch, we have Pierre <laughs> saves that French captain's life, right? And ends up kind of being friends with him and palling around and drinking a bunch of wine and telling stories of seduction and things like that. <laughs> yeah. And then he kind of feels like, I don't know, dirty for it. Like, at least that's the vibe I got. Um, at that point, Moscow is starting to go down. It's, it's, it's burning. And there's that scene where Pierre saves a little child, right? And then he can't find, essentially, the family uh, to, to return the child to. And the child is just kind of slobbering and, like, punching him in the face. And he's just kind of working through that, that reality, which I guess is maybe a non-magical moment for Pierre. That was a bit brought back to reality or that was kind of magical i mean he did like storm inside of a burning building and yeah baby wasn't she in the courtyard I think yeah she in the courtyard but i mean still <laughs> he still had to go through that's some true shit. he's on yeah I, I just mean that like I, I felt like at that moment he's like i regret this <laughs> he's also like marching he's like i'm gonna assassinate napoleon right he's got he's his got, dagger he's got his dagger in his pants and then i was like first i'm gonna rescue a baby from a burning building and then yeah. actually succeeds. File that under magical. Oh, wait, wait. Let's let's make a parallel real quick around. <laughs> Pierre marches in and takes his baby. And he, descri- he describes it as like, wow, that's an ugly baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like, I mean, he, just, he found this baby in this burning house. And his first thought is, she's hideous. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'll take her because I'm here. Pick and like chases her down because she screams and runs away. Scoops her up, and then she starts, like, slobbering and biting him. Mm-hmm. And yeah. He's like, he wants to saying. throw her back into the fire. He's like, I, re- he's like, I regret this. And then this comes isn't back as out. magical as I wanted. Is this not quite like when he tried to free his serfs? Yeah. No, that's the thing. Is like he, the reality for him never matches the vision he has in his head. His ideals. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's in the clouds, if you will. And he did sort of abandon the child afterwards. He just kind of went... Hey, you you might know who this belongs to. Take this. I'm gonna go yeah. I'm gonna go fuck <laughs> with these French soldiers. <laughs> right. Which is the closing scene. But before that, it's important to note that uh Andre and Natasha get reunited. Oh yeah. And yeah. they seem to be in love again. They're they're sort of back on it. They're they've made their apologies and and uh they're back. And then I I don't know, probably Andre's gonna die like six more times and then he'll be brought back to life. That's my projection for. Well, even even the doctor's like, this guy should be dead. What's? <laughs> <laughs> I love that the, the doctor was disappointed. Yeah, he's like, he's I like, predicted ah, his death. Shucks, his and pulse is fuck, getting stronger. This just won't die. <laughs> he's like, I said he was gonna die. Nobody's gonna take me seriously anymore if this <laughs> <Yeah>. guy lives. <laughs> he has such a strong will to life. That's what it is. It's the individual. You can per- you can persevere. I think it's his, his loving compassion saved him. He's just full of love. Yeah, that Andre. And once he saw that Anatole lost a leg, he's like, "All right, we're good now." <laughs> yeah. <Come back. laughs> Fuck this guy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't until he heard him shrieking in pain and crying like a baby that he decided to forgive him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's got the dirt on him now. I see you as a real man. And then the closing scene in which there's the Frenchman who's stealing the boots from the old man. And Pierre is like, no, you don't steal those boots. And so he goes and he roughs him up and basically gets himself arrested. And that's how we close out the volume. 
Wait, he he also. I think this is maybe not as significant. He lies and says that the baby is his baby. The, the French the French soldiers were like, "What's all this? What's this woman saying?" Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And he's like, "I just saved my child from this burning building." He's he's yeah he's aimless. He I have no idea what's going on with Pierre. Which is maybe the first question: What's going on with Pierre? Is he the Christ-like figure? Is that the vibe we're getting in Tolstoy's Christian anarchist world? Maybe. He definitely wants to sacrifice himself for something greater. <laughs> that's that's clear. Uh, whether or not he actually is that is the a world story. The w- world wants it. <laughs> yeah. But Pierre really desperately wants to be important and do something I mean, he's, he's more the Don Quixote. Yeah. That's a more accurate yeah. description. Well, we talked about everything that happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wraps it up. And how did... Uh, so, wait, let's... That's not actually a bad way to do this podcast is to just <laughs> try to summarize the entire book while interjecting random thoughts. I don't think that's actually a bad format. Honestly, I think it's the only way you can tackle like intense realism. Otherwise, it's like, like, how do you get to all of those details? You know, a lot of books we talk about, I feel like there's like one or two ideas and then the rest of it is like the prose and like how it's basically positioned and formatted and all this stuff. But mm-hmm. like, I don't know, you can't really... Can't really do that with Tolstoy. And there's so many just like little vignettes and little things that happen and characters coming in briefly and then going out for, you know, 10 more chapters and then reappearing. Yeah. But it, I mean, maybe this is sort of a repudiation of that. It's like his attempt, maybe this is why it's so long and rambling and there's so many characters is because it's it's like an attempt at um, history as calculus, the, the streaming together of a seemingly infinite number of moments. I agree with that. I think that's honestly that that passage at the beginning is one of my favorite moments of this entire book. Yes, because I am employed as an engineer. Yes, I will <laughs> I will admit that. But I think it's like I think it's very valid. I think it's one of the the most important times in which he is really putting his philosophy out there. And I've heard I've heard ram- ramblings or myths that the volume 4, which we'll get to, is like pretty heavy on the philosophy. Mm. So I'm like expecting more and more mm. of that. But this volume definitely had like a notch up of that. Like the beginning of each of the sections like started off with Tolstoy basically telling you, here's how history works. Here's how perceptions work. Here's the reality versus what people try to sell, you know. And honestly, I'm kind of getting more into that. I think I think the beginning two volumes while laying out all of the events and the characters and the love stories and the battles like yeah, that's that's fun and that's great, but I was missing some of that, like, here's how you interpret it. Here's what I'm really trying to do. Here's the message. Here's the philosophy. So I am I am getting pretty into this still, despite the fact that it is a bit oversized. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we need every vignette here. I don't know if we need that beehive analogy. There were quite a few chapters of like military strategy and discussions of the quantity of people in different like early on. He was like, Oh, this unit has this number of people mm-hmm. divided by three into this group and I'm like, I don't this doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I don't know who's getting much value out of it. Wait, which section is this is this when he's describing kind of how the army has divided itself into these yeah, yeah, yeah. three loyalties and then there's eight modes of thinking about those Three armies. Yeah. Yes. I actually, actually really like liked that, that section. Did you? Okay. I really yeah. like that. I'm like, man, this reminds me not. of work. This is how I like. I like the yeah, exactly. Like everything gets broken into. I mean, there was a quote from uh, I think the previous volume just about how people can all have the same information and and men will always interpret it interpret it in different ways. And I feel like it was like that applied to military theory, but also like applied to. <laughs> any work setting in which you have a dozen people who are all theoretically working on the same project and everybody just views everything somehow in a different lens you're like how did we get here <laughs> why are you all doing that it's just it's such a simple thing but there's just yeah so many different slices i i can't remember the military leader's name but he was the one that was somewhat more successful than most and it was he he napped through <laughs> the majority of their meeting do you remember oh, it was this? Kutuzov, right? It, I can't remember if it was him Kutuzov, or not. Kutuzov, who's... I think it's Kutuzov, and he's like, he's like, there's only two things that matter, patience and time. Yeah. They will. Yeah. They are the, the two best soldiers that we have. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I really enjoyed him. That was great. Kutuzov's awesome. I mean, there is such a... 
such a like a vote or a, an upholding of wisdom and you know the slow path in this which is arguably also what you have to be into to read this but like that <laughs> moment is like you know like he's really ripping on napoleon throughout this whole volume and about how cocky he is and, and all this like napoleon gets the cold that one time and like blames everything on like being sick and like He's kind of just saying how just overblown, like basically history's perception of Napoleon is. So, so he's I, holding up this sort of slow and steady angle versus Napoleon's cocky bullshit. He says that, but I'm also reading this and I'm thinking like, I would much rather be in Napoleon's army than in the Russian army where like everybody knows who the leader is. Everybody knows where decisions are being made and they act as one army versus like the Russian army. He, he never directly that's seems not true, to criticize actually. this compared to the russian army i mean they're I mean, just so fragmented they're, yes they're but... never in the right place they never act as a unit they seem to be constantly bickering about like the basic fundamentals of warfare yeah that's true there is at least one or two references to napoleon's army like people who are in charge of different units or maybe i read this somewhere else i can't remember now Maybe this is just from the Napoleonic Wars, but there were there, there essentially there were two different people in charge of two larger units who who were arguing with one another, and because one didn't want the other person to succeed, they didn't like merge together quick enough in order to defeat the Russians. And if they did come together faster, they could have possibly defeated the Russians. Was that in this book? Am I misremembering this from something that else? That might have been. Was that like because <laughs> yeah. there was a mention of like the fact that so much of Napoleon's army was like from. They didn't speak the same languages, and they were from different places in Europe, and they mm -hmm. brought certain things with them. Yeah, and there's a lot of digs about Germans being a very particular kind of people in this <laughs> book as well. Yeah. <laughs> I kept coming across like lots like, of digs on Germans. Like, is this is this Tolstoy's opinion, or is this like common belief at the time? Just everyone was kind of ripping on the Germans. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that got extended to this translation. Like one of the few uh, bad accents that's given in <laughs> this. This text is is the German guy from like the first volume. Like everybody else is represented. I mean, I feel like pretty accurately, but they just give him a trashy German accent. <laughs> and so I was like, "Oh, are you channeling like how this was actually represented when Tolstoy wrote it, or is that is that just like your own slice? Like what what's the what's the I mean, angle here?" It, there's there's a passage in here where he basically breaks down European countries like stereotypically, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the Germans are like this because of this. The Russians are like this because of this. The French, the are like Italians, this. the English, English are, are confident because they have the most well-managed country in the world. Yeah, we're like Tolstoy. You can't say that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, then also, there's you know when the as the Russians are retreating through Russia and uh, looting and burning their own towns, and then there's like some you know is that is that moral? Is that bad? And then the French come in and they're he he makes a point to say that they're ordered not to to loot. But I don't they know. Do. I, I I know that he makes he makes digs at Napoleon, but I feel like there's also kind of an underlying respect of the French military. I think that's definitely present in the character interactions themselves, right? Because throughout the whole first half of this book, there's that weird sort of reverence for Napoleon and the speaking of French in the elite echelons of society. But then that gets jammed together with the pro-Russia feelings, right? And so I think everybody in the book was grappling with that too. So I think it's a reasonable assumption to think that maybe some of that came from Tolstoy himself. Mm. That's my theory. This sort of love-hate relationship with France. Yeah. Who doesn't love a, a dictator, I guess? <laughs> 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 I mean, that's the whole thing right now. They're trying to figure out in France, should they... Should they uphold their reverence for Napoleon? Yeah. Was he a good dude or was he a bad dude? My vote is bad. I didn't even know that was I didn't even know that was up for a debate. Oh but. yeah. There's there's a large swath of the French that really still revere Napoleon. I don't know about a large swath, but they exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Point out that swath to me. I feel like this volume is I don't want to say treading water, because certainly a lot of war stuff happened in it. And they're actually, especially in the last section of it, with Pierre and, and the burning of Moscow, like it's starting to get interesting, right? But I still feel like this is treading water in a little bit of a way. It's just the mid-section of the book. And for a book that's kind of slogging it out, it's also sort of slogging it out to the max 
I would say it definitely solidifies the idea of war being this horrible, sort of pointless thing. Like, in the previous volumes, because it's never... Like, there's only a little bit of it, you kind of get hints at it. But here, like, even Napoleon has a moment of regret that Mm. he, of course, ignores for his own ego. But, like, Tolstoy, like, shows him looking over the scene and, and, like, feeling remorse. Mm -hmm. And almost every character that we get any perspective on during the war, in the war, talks about it being this horrible thing. There's a moment where I think think it might be Rostov. He, He gets really geared up. And he's ready to, like, go perform in war. And then he he almost kills this French soldier who surrenders. But he's, like, close to killing him. Mm -hmm. And he, like, makes eye contact. Yeah. And he, like, sees that it's just a young man, like, much like himself. Yeah. He's scared like everyone else. That uh, that comes across almost repetitively Mm -hmm. throughout this volume. Yeah. And there's also a section, so I think Pierre... He's either hearing a voice in his head or Mm. I don't remember exactly the context of which this comes about. But this, I think, ties together a lot of the things we've been cycling on where it says, War is the subjection of man's will to the law of God at its most agonizing extreme, said the voice. Simplicity is submitting to God's will. You cannot escape him. And they are simple. They don't talk. They do things. Spoken words are silver. Unspoken words are gold. A man can be master of nothing while ever he fears death. And the man that fears not death possesses everything. Without suffering, a man would know not his limits, would know not himself. The hardest thing, he trails off, is to know how to unite in your soul the meaning of the whole. Unite the whole? And then it goes on and Pierre ruminates on unity and uniting these pieces and, and I don't know, more Pierre floating above the world thoughts. But I think that that concept of war being super terrible is certainly outlined here in all of its uh, brutal realism via Tolstoy. But also the question that we're asking ourselves at the beginning of how does war fit into, I don't know if it is Christian anarchism or whatever ism you want to throw on it, but essentially that war is a result of God's will somehow, that this chaos and this mess is somehow built into that. If you believe in, you know, divine passages and and things that are already set in stone, that you're just a, a, a puzzle piece, I guess. You know, I think I think that's what's getting tied together in this volume. What you're saying right now isn't even your own original thought. You just had to say it in this moment so that we can discuss it and that a handful of people could listen to it and uh... just <laughs> upload your consciousness to the cloud and then press the podcast routine. That's all it is. It's fine. Do you? Do any of you prescribe to this belief that I'm assuming you don't? But I that history is somehow predetermined. I mean, it, I I think he walks. A, I think he walks an interesting line trying to define the difference between what you have control over and not. And the, and I think where it makes sense to me is like is a mob. You know, there are individuals in a mob, but the mob does things that the individuals want to do on their own. So then who's in control of the mob? And are the, if the people in the mob do things when they're in a mob that they wouldn't do if they weren't in a mob, are they responsible for those things? Or is there some other consciousness that emerged and was moving forward that was somehow an aggregate of everybody involved? And I, so I, I think that, I think history works in a similar way. I don't know if that means that it's predetermined, but it, it means that it's determined outside of individual will. any individual will. Yeah. What what I would say is, is sort of on top of that, I don't know if I believe in predeterminism, but I do believe that we are working with such a complex system that the idea of attributing direct causality to things is super laughable to me. And we, we do this now, right? Like we have, a, we have a new president who takes office and then the first like month or two, we decide that this person did this thing or did not do this thing, especially mm-hmm. the economy. That's one of the most laughable things to me. Oh, right? Where, or like, the fact that we can really put responsibility on one person in general. Yeah, exactly. Funny. But you have yeah. this huge macro system that's global, has all these different impacts that have years of momentum in certain directions. And then you have a change in political office and cert- suddenly somebody gets credit for doing this thing or gets blamed for not doing this thing. And the, the result that happens in that moment in time, when in reality, it was probably set in stone decades before, right? And like how much control 
to the old quote in this that I read before, the higher up in the hierarchy, the, the less free will you have. And so I think it, that is a pretty logical way of viewing Tolstoy's stuff, which is simply that like he's saying nobody can wrap their arms around this to really create causality. I think there's I think there's a there's a a force that he's not really giving credit to, and that is basically um, the meme, which is Napoleon may or may not have been a war a genius of war, and he I mean Tolstoy kind of tears that apart. Yeah, but Napoleon inspired people everywhere to join his cause and fight with him. And that, I think, when we talk about great people and their influence, that's what really what we're talking about, is their ability to put a thought, put their thought in someone else's head in a way that's so sticky that that person lives it out as if it's their truth. Yeah. Oh, man, there's a really good passage somewhere where Napoleon, it talks about him choosing really not to do anything and just let his presence be the driving factor and let people kind of do right. what they're yeah. supposed to do. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is this related to when all the Polish uh, soldiers drown themselves in the river? Yeah, they're like running across the river There's a just few because points, they want yeah. to impress him like that. But so I so a flip side to that is, is, it, is there actually causality between that type of person and their image and their ability to put out this, I guess, force we'll go with? Or is it that that person is the same all along and some elements in the system, i.e. greater society, the public, have shifted to where it then appears that there's causality? And the perhaps the pop culture example of this is sometimes we say that Nirvana sold out or that Green Day sold out or whatever these bands are sold out. In reality, they just made the same exact music that they were making anyway, but the public's ability to be ready for that and the subsequent capitalization on that shifted they didn't really become a different kind of band they just capitalized on that moment of the public shifting so if we think about that in historical terms because obviously making nirvana comparisons to napoleon is great um was napoleon always like that and were these great leaders or great historical people were they just basically in the right spot at the right time with these shifts well, in history I don't think, to allow the momentum to happen that way. I don't think it's one Absolutely, or the other. Absolutely, but I don't think that that's, that's mutually exclusive. It's yeah. like, is a great surfer somebody who creates a wave? Of course not. The great surfer is the one who recognizes and catches it. Um, like Elon Musk wasn't preaching about Dogecoin 10 years ago. But for some reason, he this saw like that this was going to be a meme. the fourth time you've mentioned Dogecoin, Nathan. What, what's happening? Are you... We're getting he's, he's appearing Musk. on Saturday Night Live tonight. I, I put $50 investor? in Dogecoin, so okay. I'm invested now. <laughs> that explains it. Okay, okay. But I, I think that it's, it's, a fascinating concept. it's a fascinating idea to me because why on earth has this become a meme? Why, why is this so sticky? Why are people putting money into it? What's happening? It's the same. I mean, it's the same thing as as how this history in War and Peace and what Tolstoy is arguing is that essentially, once things start to get solidified and there's a correct public perception of it, or rather a a unified public perception, then it becomes cemented and it becomes incrementally more real. And as it becomes more real, then it's easier for people to agree to this perception of it. And that's essentially what Tolstoy is creating some sort of idea that the collective conscious is the first NFT. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, that is what I'm saying. Because there's no difference in a society's agreement for a common historical narrative versus our acceptance of value in terms of currency. It all, re it all requires the collective, like the consciousness of deciding that these things are of value and that once they're of value, it's easier to make them slightly more valuable and make them more concrete. And then eventually it becomes concrete because whether or not you're talking about Nathan's obsession with cryptocurrency or the dollar bill, neither are real. The dollar is not real. It's just a fucking macroeconomic currency. 
based on a ratio of things that I completely don't understand. It's not based on it's not based on anything. It's no gold standard. It's over. It's just a cryptocurrency. Well, I wouldn't say it's based on nothing. I mean, oh, wow. Well, let's based not get what? into, into currency. But I mean, <laughs> that's what history <laughs> is. History is the currency. But, it's not based on what? anything. It's based on a collective agreement that this is how it went down. And it takes a lot to shift that once it's been so solidified, just like the dollar. The yeah. dollar was the cryptocurrency well, of the 1800s, man. So the that. whole thing that Nick read at the beginning about breaking things down into smaller and smaller parts is about the the power it takes for a computer system to to sort of mine for this crypto, which is historical. <laughs> oh, shit. Where's this analogy going? <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. All right. Stick with this. <laughs> Tie it together. Make Tolstoy right. proud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think this. I think. But this I mean, all I think. Fits. I think. I think a meme is. It's more than that. It's more than just agreement. It's like a meme can be something that everybody passionately disagrees with. Sure. Well, it's a, it's it's like, a unified. For some reason, it's just. It's a unified view, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be like pro or con, right? But it's something that essentially fits that mold. I don't think it has to be a unified view either. I mean, I think people can be in, in strong disagreement about it. A unified view of its, essentially, its importance in a way. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the Dawkins definition of a meme, right? Yeah. Okay. So wouldn't the unified view be a necessary part? Otherwise, wouldn't it not be a meme? Well, I think if you said a unified view, that would be... I, I guess what, what I'm hearing is like, it, we all think that it is significant or funny or... Um, reprehensible or whatever like we have a same we share a perspective on it versus we all have a perspective on it it's like it's um and i don't think it's a matter of importance either i think it's it's almost like it's beyond our control just like tolstoy saying about history yeah i mean i think there's i think there's something to that like there is the meme appears in it like it appears simultaneously in all of our heads somehow it was there and then somebody captures the fact that that meme was in our brains and it seems like they put that there. And the, the great person is the person who can seize that and recognize that and move on that. Yeah, yeah. but the causality wasn't necessarily like predetermined. That's what I'm saying. These, there's this complex system where these things align and then we attribute causality to this of I made blank and it became blank and this had this effect. But in reality, all of these things are in motion and when you know the magical gears line up perfectly, that's when you get that, that moment. That's yeah. when you get that historical agreement. That's also when you get whatever, I don't know if we're saying viral events or, or memes or, or explosions in cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah, you can't trace that initial cause just... Zeno's arrow will never get to a middle point. Yeah. Mm. That's right. Or bring it back to the math. He doesn't. No, he uses the Achilles and tortoise one. <laughs> same same <laughs> idea. Uh, where are we at with this? Because. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this, this episode is off the deep end. This is either going to be. Followed that. If, if you followed this, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Welcome to volume three of War and Peace. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You can find out more about us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Instagram and Twitter with the handle booksosubstance. If you're reading along with us, we're on the home stretch now. Our final episode on volume four and the epilogues, of course, will follow in June. And as always, if you can, click some buttons on the internet for reviews and likes and all that good stuff. Every little bit helps. Until next time, happy reading. There's Achilles covers that tenth, by which time and tortoise. <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> it's too fucking boring to read. All right. Okay, okay. Let me get back uh, in the zone. Maybe a different. No, no, I'm getting back in the is zone. Is this the best yeah, thing wait, to start sure? off a podcast? No, no, no. I'm sure this is how we want to start like, this episode. We, we just had a conversation about getting more people. I don't know if starting <laughs> with, <laughs> with this passage. Dude, it's the third, it's the third volume of War of Peace. This is not the one to bring in new clientele. 
I mean, there's like okay, lots of war like, yeah. and death and let me gore see. Okay, I'm gonna take the run. Start at, no, 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 I'm gonna take a run at this. <laughs> if I can make it like another halfway through, we're gonna keep doing this. If I can't get through this paragraph, we're cutting it.